Linked to that as the next takeaway, the rural areas of this reflected the unique diversity of this country. Religion into politics is dangerous in a country like India. It's expressed in this blog are hosted on my own website, are strictly personal and do not reflect the views of any organization. Hello and welcome Namaskar to Straight Bat, my weekly video blog, whereas the title suggests I comment with a straight bat. This is a midweek special because this has been a special week. The week where India has counted and the general elections of 2024 have thrown up a quite remarkable verdict, a verdict that few would have predicted just a couple of days ago. All the exit pollsters have got it horribly wrong. And the reality is at the end of the day, we now have what they would call a Mili Juli Sarkar, a coalition government which will be headed by the BJP. So there are plenty of takeaways that I have for you, my friends, from this historic verdict that has been delivered by the wonderful people of this great country called India, that is Bharat. Takeaway number one. I believe that the people of India have reflected the unique diversity of this country. This was an election which can be best described as state-by-state state competition. The BJP was keen to make it presidential. From Kashmir to Kanyakumari, only one name, Narendra Modi, Modi ki guarantee. The truth of the matter is, voters in different states have voted on different issues. So the voter in Maharashtra has voted differently to that in neighboring Gujarat. Voter in Uttar Pradesh voting differently to that in Bihar across the Hindi heartland. From Bengal to Odisha, different voting patterns. From Andhra to Tamil Nadu, different voting patterns again. Diversity has won out over uniformity. The attempt to suggest that India is a single leader, single party, single nation has been squarely rejected by the Indian voter, which is why they have reflected in a way their desire for a more accommodative coalition, a Mili Juli Sarkar, because my friends, this great country is a coalition after all. Takeaway number two. The BJP is undoubtedly party number one and Narendra Modi ji remains leader number one. It is not easy to beat back 10 years of anti-incumbency after being in power and then still uh, complete a hat-trick. The last leader to do that was the great Jawaharlal Nehru. Competition perhaps was much less. Despite that frenzied competition, Mr. Modi in all likelihood will become the Prime Minister of the country yet again. So there's no doubt that the BJP remains party number one, Pan-India winning a seat in Kerala for example for the first time. But, and this is an important but, if the BJP thinks that purely banking on the Modi name will win it elections anymore, they are sadly mistaken. We've seen that in this election very clearly. The choice of candidates, the unwillingness to take along people, murmurs of dissent even in Uttar Pradesh that Yogi Adityanath was unhappy with the choice of candidates. The manner in which the BJP leadership believed that purely brand Modi was enough to win an election, not happening anymore. There are local factors that will have to be accounted for. The BJP itself will have to be a little bit more humble when it deals, the leadership, when it deals with its karyakartas across the country. And that leads me to what I believe is an important point. A takeaway that the voters have rejected the arrogance of power. Remember, Apki Bar Charso Par was a drumbeat for the last few months, almost as if it was a done deal. Well, the voters said, and I think somewhere down the line, the BJP almost took this election. Some would say, or at least the voter at one level, took the voter for granted with that Charso Par uh, slogan. And it came back to bite them in some way or the other. Arrogance of power is reflected in various ways. Look at the manner, for example, uh, in, in Maharashtra. Parties were broken, deal making was done, almost as if the voter or the citizen's concerns didn't matter at all. Well, the citizen in states like Maharashtra has sent a message. Enough is enough. There are limits to deal making. Or indeed what we saw in Amethi, where Smriti Rani, who's worked hard on the ground, was in some way defeated by Kishori Lal Sharma of the Congress, a faceless worker, quite simply because Kishori Lal was seen as someone who is in Amethi, available to people night and day, Smriti Rani was a high-flying minister. And not all Karyakartas were apparently 
happy with her style of functioning. And the voter has responded. Arrogance of Par Jagan Mohan Reddy, arresting Chandra Babu Naidu at the age of 73. That arrest, if anything, perhaps triggered sympathy for Chandra Babu Naidu last year. Another takeaway. Mandal 2.0 has in some way trumped Mandir of the 21st century. The BJP lost in Faisabad, where Ayodhya is, where the Ram Mandir is located, where their candidate Lalu Singh lost to a Samajwadi party candidate who comes from the Pasi community. As someone told me there's a slogan there, forget Mathura, forget Kashi, is bar Pasi ko vote. There are caste identities that sometimes can undercut this belief that there is a Hindu monolith that exists, especially the caste that still exists at the bottom of the social pyramid. And in some way, Akhilesh Yadav was successful in sending out the message that his new PDA, the Pichra Dalit Alp Sankhya combined, was a wider social coalition. Takeaway number six or the next takeaway, the Dalit voter. It's very interesting that one of the uh, data points that more than 90 of the 150 Dalit dominated constituencies, constituencies where Dalits comprise more than 20%, a large chunk of them went to the India Alliance. So those at the bottom of the pyramid, those who've really been hurt by COVID, post-COVID distress, incomes falling, they needed people to reach out to them. And often many of their MPs perhaps didn't reach out to them in COVID times. I know that Dalits were also being influenced by this whole discourse of Savvidan Khatre Mein reservations will go. But truly, I believe it was also not just a caste but a class issue. That those at the bottom of the pyramid who are people who are victims of an unequal society were the ones who were calling for comfort and compassion and they were not getting that form of compassion and governance. Linked to that as a next takeaway, the rural areas of this country. Sharpening rural-urban divide in this country. We've seen several parts of rural India actually where anti-incumbency was at its strongest. I traveled through Maharashtra and you could see it. Conditions of drought over a couple of years, water scarcity, someone, some farmers complaining about restrictions on onion exports, others complaining that they were not getting remunerative prices. Rural distress is real. And you can't decide that merely giving us the GDP numbers in uh, some uh, plush five-star hotel. Down on the ground, the reality is often very different. And that perhaps, that rural distress was a factor in this election. The Mahila voter. I mentioned this in a blog a few weeks ago and I repeat it. You can't win an Indian election comprehensively without the support of the Mahila voter. And the women is... The, the women in different parts of the state reflect the diversity of this country, which is why, for example, in some part of the country, they may well back the BJP and the prime minister on 5 kg ration or an Awas Yojana scheme or an Ujwala scheme. But in Bengal, they may back a Mamta Banerjee for a Lokher Bandar scheme where she provides 1200 rupees to a woman in a household. And that may be an important reason why Mamta Banerjee was able to stave off anti-incumbency in Bengal. So the woman voter, the power of 49, remains a key factor in Indian elections. Also what works in Indian elections is alliance politics. When you strike alliances intelligently, they work. The BJP was able to do it in Karnataka with the JDS and ma managed to corner a substantial Vokaliga vote and did well in Karnataka. The BJP struck an alliance with Chandra Babu Naidu and they benefited from it. The BJP, for example, in Bihar got Nitish Kumar back into the fold, Chirag Paswan into the fold and they were able to, in a sense, retain a dominant position in Bihar. By contrast, in Maharashtra, it's an unnatural alliance. The same Ajit Pawar you call corrupt, you brought in Ekna Chinde is clearly not Shiv Sena's neta number one. So alliance politics may work in one state, it doesn't work in the other. Same thing with the India alliance. Their alliance between Akhilesh and Rahul Gandhi worked in UP, but it, the alliance didn't work in Delhi between AAP and Congress because there was no chemistry on the ground. It worked in Maharashtra for the MBA because Sharad Pawar held it together. Alliance politics requires arithmetic and chemistry. And if the India alliance had maybe ensured that Nitish didn't leave it, maybe reached out to a Chandra Babu Naidu, who knows? They might have been in pole position in this election. Then the North-South divide. So much of talk 
of it before the election. The truth of the matter is, the divide is slowly but surely finding ways of evaporating. You are seeing the BJP grow slowly in parts of southern India, first seat that they won in Kerala. But they are a dominant party still in Karnataka, major party there. They have done decently in Telangana and they are part now of a ruling alliance in Andhra. Similarly, the India alliance which was completely almost demolished or the Congress in particular was demolished in the Hindi heartland in 2019 and 14. They have shown some signs of recovery. Politics is never static. The map of the country keeps changing. Speaking of the Congress, my next takeaway. The Congress is ending up with around 100 seats, 99 to 100 seats. For a party which got 52 seats last time, that's almost double. And there is reason to believe that Rahul Gandhi has had a major role to play. His yatra certainly galvanized the Congress. It gave the Congress some kind of narrative to speak on, speaking on issues of inequality. I'm not sure whether caste census worked, but the guarantees of the Congress, the, uh, the attempt by the Congress to reach out uh, to marginalized sections may well have worked and Rahul Gandhi deserves some credit. But the worry is the Congress will get complacent, believing, oh, we've now reached 100. We are in the race. No, the fact is you are still well behind the BJP. So the Congress is going to have to double its energies, double its efforts, improve its organizational strength if it really wants to take on the BJP. Let me turn to two last points which really are of personal, which I feel strongly about. One is religion. Right through this election, we have seen an attempt being made to bring in the toxicity of religion into the election campaign. Mangal Sutra, Machli, Matan, Mujra, the kind of language that's used. Reservations will go only to Muslims. Uh, I mean, what kind of language and discourse is this? This attempt to bring in religion into politics is dangerous in a country like India. We have one of the largest Muslim populations in the world. And the challenge of India and the charm of India is when we are able to reconcile rather than polarize. And somewhere when I went across this country, I was reassured, particularly by the young. They are tiring of this Hindu-Muslim narrative. And they want you to talk about their real issues. Talk about Rozgar, unemployment. Along with rural distress, unemployment was a major factor, which is why a number of voters, 18 to 23 age group, have voted against the incumbent. That's the issue which you need to address. Real issues, Mengai, unemployment, not talk constantly about Hindu, Muslim and demonize a community. Which brings me as I conclude to the fact that I really at the end of the day want to celebrate that we are this remarkably diverse country in the world. We are not China. Everyone says democracy is dead. Democracy khatre mein hai. The voter has shown. The faceless voter, often at the bottom of the pyramid, often living on just 6,000 rupees a month, has said, I will show you what true democracy is. It's perhaps the fat cats who don't even vote, who have more reason to be asked questions of. Not the poor, humble, anonymous Indian who still comes out and votes in soaring temperatures and sends out strong messages to his or her netas. And you know what? As I end, I want to give you a postscript today. I don't know whether I will ever do another election. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, who knows? Maybe retirement beckons. But either way, I want to say this to some of my media friends. For much too long, all I have seen in the last several years is what I call Damru journalism, beating the drumbeat of one leader, one party, constantly creating Hindu-Muslim fissures in slanging matches in television studios. We need to give up the noise and come back to the news. We need to tell the real issues, not just once in five years when we go on our election travels, but more regularly. The people of this country need a strong, vibrant and independent media. And this is our opportunity to do so. Whether the opposition does it or not, we in the media must remain the country's perennial opposition, always telling truth to power, whoever is in power from whichever party. That, my friends, is in a way a message that perhaps the voters are sending to us in the media too. They too want us to somewhere change course. Think about it. Thanks for watching. Stay well. Stay safe. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel for many more such videos. For now, Namaskar, Jai Hind, Jai Bharat.